Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm George Shackelford, Deputy Director of the Kimball Art Museum. And with me is Matt Clayberg, a painter um, who's living in San Antonio and who is in his studio there uh, with surrounded by his drawings and paintings. You're gonna get, get, get to see a little bit more of that later. And, uh, and I hope that you will, um, you will enjoy uh, hearing about what Matt's doing and what his thoughts are about works of art at the Kimball. Uh, here's a larger view of Matt and me, uh, just so you can see um, I'm the old guy in the suit and tie and Matt is the young guy in, the <laughs> in his studio with a, with, or in, another, in a gallery with another wonderful painting uh, by in, him. In need of a haircut. <laughs> Probably the same for me. Um, I am going to uh, move us to the uh, next screen and talk to you and sorry, there we go. Um, this is uh, the painting that when I invited Matt to participate in this program, uh, which as you know, is an uh, ongoing series has been many years, decades even, um, that the Artist Eye program has been happening on Saturday mornings at 11, usually in the Kimball galleries uh, in front of the actual works of art but we're going virtual uh, in this uh, coronavirus world and, uh, and being very socially distanced. We are not, however, um, uh, as smelly as the body of Lazarus apparently was when Matt um, said that he wanted to talk about the Duccio, I was thrilled. It's the earliest painting that we have on our walls right now. And it's uh, such, a, such a wonder that, uh, that this painting was the was the one that Matt first named to me to talk about. Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit of your thoughts about this Duccio and um, shall I go to the detail or stick with the full painting now? We'll stick with this for, for a second. Um, I think what I have always really appreciated about this painting and about the, the Sienese painters in general is the sense of um, both warmth and humanity. I mean, you really get uh, you really get a sense for the people's reaction to the tomb being opened. Um, I mean, the figures feel like they're part of a living, breathing narrative. But but that quality coupled with the way everything in the painting feels like it was carved out of stone. Um, I mean, no pun intended, a carved tomb, but just the way the trees and the rocks and the halos and the sarcophagus, they just feel bolted into place. Um, it just feels like such a well-structured and constructed image. I mean, it has been around for hundreds of years, but but the the composition feels like it is totally essential, and that that image, um, you know, for all of its warmth and humanity, is also completely timeless. I mean, you feel the same quality with Piero and Fra Angelico, and um, yeah, just this sense of uh, a just so structure. And now we, we can. We can zoom into the detail. Yeah. I think as it pertains to to my own work, um, there's something I've always really appreciated about this painting. Um, the way that tomb frames out the figure of Lazarus, the way there, there's the sort of taking away of the of the door. And this and this reveal of the you know figure of Lazarus you know newly raised to life, um, and I just think it's uh, there's such a sense of drama the way that the the frame of the tomb frames the figure and the the stone grotto frames the tomb, um, and I think it's a kind of theatrical um, moment that. In my paintings, I've tried to 
um, a capture a similar sense of expectant um, anticipatory space. Um, I think we should so maybe the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. There's there's a painting by Matt hanging on the um, on the right hand screen, hanging on a wall. You see the floor and the wall, and then the uh, obviously the Duccio raising of Lazarus on the side. Yeah, I think that for me, I like that sense of almost like a theatrical drama of this um, kind of bombastic. Um, focusing in on that space that that in my painting is kind of ultimately uh vacant or or potential sort of not actually filled in the way that the in the way that Lazarus fills the frame um let's uh let's let's move forward to um to talk about uh you and the um and the way your work has progressed over the last uh, decade or so, basically. Um, there you are again. And here's a painting that was painted 10 years ago. Um, it's, it's interesting, Matt, that at, at that stage, you were still using imagery that came from your family business in ranching. And, uh, and here we are with, uh, you know, some of the charros uh, from, um, from your um, uh, enterprise. And, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, you know where this painting came from and and what you started doing with it. Yeah, I grew up around a family cattle ranch in South Texas, and there was uh, a lot of great photographers who who chronicled um, life on the ranch through the '30s, '40s, up through the you know present day. And as a kid growing up, looking at those photos and hearing stories about these famous or infamous um, cowboys and cousins. And um, there was a like, sense of family mythology, kind of larger than life figures. Um, and I made paintings for a long time, working through that imagery and constructing a sort of complicated iconography uh, that, that mined some of those images. And we'll see, we'll see some uh, coming up yeah. where, yeah, that's a, that's a taken from a photo of a family member. Um, and they, yeah, the paintings were really just kind of contending with what does it mean to be a part of this, you know, long narrative, but also not being a, any kind of a proficient cattleman myself. Um, and the figures, as you'll see in a lot of these images, continued to be kind of centrally placed, sort of central, frontal, iconographic, um, always placed in the, you know, the the seat of honor within yeah. the picture plane. And this is a this is sort of a breakthrough uh, for breakthrough picture for you because you yep. abandon the reliance on um, on any kind of photography and are painting out of your head. Yeah. At, or yeah, actually, here, no, actually I, you told me it actually is based on a photograph in some way. Yeah, it was based on a photograph of a guy who who genuinely had um, had two trained vultures that he could send out to fly around in circles and they'd come and land. He didn't hold them by the wings, he held them by the legs. Yeah. But um, yeah, I was looking a lot at, at uh, Byzantine icons, that sense of, um, kind of static structure that also nodded at narrative. And then I was also looking at people like Marsden Hartley and mm -hmm. some of the American modernists who were, you know, really carving out the figures with paint. Um, if you've been across the street over to the modern and you've seen the big David Bates, Night Heron painting. Yes. Um, yeah, sort of thinking about yeah. people like Hartley and uh, Beckman. Right. Um, yeah, and this painting, I really love this painting, but what, in the studio you finish a painting and um, your, each painting kind of leads to a next, mm -hmm. a next painting, a next step. There's some kind of prompt from whatever you've just finished that 
suggest you have to kind of keep digging. And I really thought this painting was successful, but thinking about the next painting, it wasn't the sense of narrative that I was really interested in. It was more playing around with the forms of those vultures. And so this painting of a caracara, which is another carrion bird in South Texas, um, it was almost a caveman attempt at making a painting that was just a bird. Um, you know, I decided I would strip strip the painting of any possible narrative and and fill every possible square inch with bird. Um, and of course, there's kind of a uh, a narrative in there anyway. Um, but yeah, I like the idea of the of the figure in the painting having to contend with the the restraints of the picture plane, yes. the actual edges of the canvas. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, some painters tr can treat a, a canvas like a cinema screen where figures are coming on and off stage, um, mm -hmm. coming in and out of uh, focus and view. For me, I've always thought of the picture plane as, as a finite structure. It's a, it's a thing. It's a, I mean, it's kind of cliche to think of it as a window, but yeah. I have thought of it more as a stage, you know, something yeah. that you're, you're either on it or you're off it. Um, and the, and the, so the flatness is also one thing that's, that, that, that the bird is completely flattened. And yeah. when I was looking yeah. at it first, I, was, I, I couldn't help but think A, of two things, of the paintings of David Bates, which it reminds me a lot of, mm -hmm. but also something in the way the, um, the feathers and the wings are become shapes that don't necessarily that that you couldn't fly with, um, and it reminded yeah. me immediately of uh, of Matisse, and yeah. uh, and some of his cutouts. Um, this the the snail is a is a perfect example, as you said uh, when we were looking at it earlier, um, where where it becomes about making patterns out of yeah. shapes. The, the other thing I think people should know is that this painting and the, um, the man with the vultures were painted when you moved to uh, New York to study at Pratt. And they were, yeah. they were, they were part of your, the, the, the sort of beginning of your work there. And I want to move on to um, the, how, this, how this developed as you told me, this is the bird in pieces, um, yeah. trying, to, trying just to be a shape rather than uh, a narrative. Yeah, so like I said, from the, from the original vulture painting, kind of stripping the narrative way, away and getting straight to just the form of the bird. And then mm -hmm. even from there, the way that that bird fit in the space, I like the idea yeah. of, of fitting the shape into space and so the bird kind of broke up into pieces in a sort yeah. of gory way um, and was then reordered almost like uh, you know arranging silverware in a drawer or something yes yes um, which or, again or, is kind of a, like shallow nearly flat plane yeah. and, yeah. and and then the um the the painting moved on to something that becomes here um virtually abstract um, but still has space that you still yeah. very much feel that the that the objects are existing in a kind of quite shallow but nonetheless present space. Yeah, whatever import the bird held at the time, that sort of started to wane. And so it became less important that they were bird parts and more important that they were just shapes um, ordered in space. Um, yeah, I really like this, this pair with the yeah. uh, Matisse snail. Yeah. Because I like, I mean, the Matisse one is genius. It's it's totally flat, but but your eye is still guided around. I mean, it is it is flat. Every shape is glued into place, but it still feels like it has movement. Um, your yeah. eye is still taken through the image. It still sings. There's so much energy in it, and 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 tr kind of capturing that is, I think, something that you um, that you at this point. Were, were kind of contending with. Um, yeah. I, br I brought in our Matisse because it too is flat and yet full of movement. Um, right. And I, I love here the, the parallels between the way you are, are applying the color to these big shapes, but with a 
huge brush to yep. um, to you know, and and I, I I saw that as a comparison to the like the fur or the um, uh, sort of lilac colored fabric on uh, yep. the Aziz uh, uh, coat, which she's wearing, sort of slung over her one uh, one arm. And I think you know you see the 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 stripes of the of the dress. Um, I think what we're going to see going looking at work going forward is this back and forth tension between flatness and space, but yep. also um, like a, a kind of static quality and a dynamic yes. quality in the way your eye kind of responds. I mean, the, the stripes actually refer to uh, the patterning on her garment, and yet they seem to be independent and have a life of their own. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I was interested in, uh, in this uh, sequence, which I was uh, actually looking at again on, on Instagram and discovering that the painting at the left was painted on the, was the state it was at on the 22nd of April. Uh, two days later, uh, more color had been filled in and the hues slightly changed. And yeah. then it, sort of two weeks later, it's completely transformed. Yeah, and it's worth mentioning here that that painting came right after the, the big kind of stack of boulders where yes. after the parts, after the bird parts sort of gave way to these just abstracted flat shapes, the way those stacked up, they kind of couldn't help but feel architectural. Yes. And I um, sort of out of my own insecurity, like a need to grab on to some kind of subject, started putting in this, you know, it was like an altar to mezcal, um, sort of putting subject matter back into the space. Um, and ultimately the, the center image there is kind of where it landed first. And it just felt like a, um, like a caricature, like a, you know, cheesy postcard or something. Yeah. And so the image on the right, you know, sometimes um, you have like Flannery O'Connor talks about killing her darlings. You know, if there's a, a paragraph that, uh, that just isn't working, but there's a, a sentence that she's holding on to um, because she likes it so much, she would, she would kill off that sentence for the sake of the paragraph or for the story. And I felt like I liked the way those shapes were stacking up in that painting, but I was holding on to them while the rest of the painting suffered. And yeah. so the way that I thought of kind of killing off the darlings was to flatten that whole background yeah. um, with, with stripes, kind of just turning it into a ornamental backdrop um, that and ultimately flattened the, picture plane and, and made it a more interesting painting. It's a real insistence on what on on flatness there at the background upon which are collaged these other elements. So you right you, you in a sense made a background around them. Um, yeah. I, I I think there's a obvious uh, reference to uh, somebody like Frank Stella uh, in the the picking up of the stripe idea. Uh, he's of course so well known for his early stripe paintings and for the the way those kind of developed over over about a ten year period. Um, yeah, this is at this point, the stripes became a, a predominant motif in the paintings, and for me, they were they created an opportunity to construct space. I, I started to think of them almost like Lincoln logs or or blocks, mm -hmm. the actual construction material. You know, every stripe was was you know, creating a beam or creating a column, you know, kind of post and lintel. Um, and, and at the same time, playing around with color relationships and juxtapositions okay. allowed you to kind of subvert the space that you were creating at the same right. time. Right. And I think, you know, people um, who look at a picture like this, this two, um, two paneled uh, painting by Stella, um, you know, immediately you get the sense of um, projecting into deep space. You know, mm -hmm. there's an axial perspective thing going on that you can't avoid. And um, but it also get... it also is coming straight back out at you. I mean, it's yes. also this yeah. kind of uh, um, almost an attack to your That's own right. embodied space. It's it's like, a, and you will. Um, we're not going to see as much of it today, but you are very engaged sometimes in a space that that keeps changing 
its dimension as you look mm -hmm. at it. Yeah. Um, this was the next painting after the still life with skull and agave and uh, mezcal bottle. But the one of the things that I, I saw in discussion with you is that this marks a real, uh, a real turning point. So the next thing you're doing is something like this. And, um, yeah. and this painting really sort of introduces the, the, this sense of absence um, in your work that is, um, that I think anticipatory, I think is the word that you used earlier in talking about the painting with Duccio. Yeah, I think that, that, that the, for me, the paintings have you know, evolved sort of slowly and through fits and starts, but the, like that mezcal bottle painting one, one slide back was stripping out what felt non-essential from the previous painting yeah. with the skull and the agave um, right. and really giving it that singular subject. And then even that felt like the bottle was almost just a plug-in, just a yeah. kind of a non-essential add-on. Um, I mean, I, I really like that painting, but um, yeah, the painting after, it just felt like the bottle needed to be carved out or plucked out. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, that felt like another darling that I was yeah. holding yes. on to. Yeah. And so after that, you know, with this painting here on the right, that, um, that central kind of vacant niche space was accidental. It was, it was intended, um, the drawings that kind of led up to that painting were all had a bottle in that space. Uh -huh. And uh, it just felt like it didn't need to be there. Yeah. And that space where the bottle had been kind of became the subject. And so you see the kind of wonky stairway leading up yep. there and the, the curtain forms that in my mind were trying to build up some kind of sense of expectation mm -hmm. um, that ultimately is kind of, um, uh, it's like, what was the, uh, the big news story where Geraldo was going to open up some tomb yeah. or some, or, or it was like a, some Al, gangster. Al, Cap Al Capone yeah. safe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The cameras are, the cameras are there and everyone's waiting with bated breath and they open up the safe and there's like a, you know, a mothball inside. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I like that sense of kind of expectation and, um, and vacancy. Yeah. Um, but you know, maybe they really expectant vacancy. All the all these paintings really seem to me the 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 ones that become architectural, and that's really where you start going at this period in um, in your uh, evolution. Um, there there seems to be both something unsettling and something celebratory or joyful at the same time. It's a real interesting tension there. Yeah. Um, between the two, uh, you were telling me that that you would never have made this painting had you not settled to live in Brooklyn. And I just um, brought up a, a, a classic New York uh, brownstone uh, to suggest that yes, these patternings of arches and windows um, uh, do very much relate to the, the residential urban architecture of New York City in a, that, that proliferates all through Manhattan and Brooklyn. Yeah, it's hard to know why the subject matter, why one body of work comes to an end and ushers in a different thought. But yeah, I don't think the work would have gone this way if I hadn't moved to New York. And certainly the architecture in the paintings was at least in part a reflection of having cityscape as my yeah. immediate yeah. surroundings. But, the, but it doesn't really become your, uh, your main direction, in fact, uh, because uh, though, uh, I, I, let's see, you, you sort of ab abandon such direct referential architecture, but then you engage mm -hmm. in painting in architecture, uh, these two, uh, a, a bathroom, a powder room at the right and an entrance hall uh, at the left in a, in a gallery space, is it? Yeah, the one on the left was a gallery space. Yeah, so you're, you're commissioned to, um, to do what you want to with the existing architecture, which is you know, fascinating that you create these kind of corbels under, the, under a, an expanded cornice. Um, and then I'm particularly entranced by the um, paintings around, the way the paint 
flows around the light switch and the plug. Um, yeah, the yeah. Electric outlet at the bottom. Yeah, um, I think in the same way that the that with that Karakara painting where the the constraints of that rectangle dictated how the how the image fit in the space. Yep. Um, similarly, I like letting the the form dictate the image. So the, actually, the yeah. Duccio is a, a one panel of this sixteen foot tall altarpiece. Yeah. Um, and I'm always thinking about you know, the painting as an object, as, a, as an actual thing in space, and then mm -hmm. also as a kind of vessel that holds an image. And so particularly with the space on the left, it was a really appealing setting for a, an installation like that because the space itself already suggested how the painting could play out, you know, between yeah. the, the, the kind of ornate doorways and then also the plugs and switches and fuse boxes that it didn't feel right to ignore them. It felt right, right. You know, yeah, more... they need to be they don't need to be hidden, they need to be highlighted. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I, exactly. I think you I think that's interesting because when you talk about the Duccio, um, I wish I could pull up another slide of it quickly right now. The um it's one of uh dozens of panels that make up the Maya star altarpiece. Um part of the, the altarpiece that was uh, dismantled and sold in the 19th and early 20th century. Yeah. And, uh, and Duccio was constrained by the shape. Every panel in the altarpiece is yeah. the same shape and size. And so that, um, that too gives him that, uh, that how will I make a new composition within this yeah. size that I have set up for myself um, that that uh, interest in architecture uh, seems to go on through your through your non-painting um, visual experiments. These are snapshots that you posted on Instagram, and I found them, though different from each other, sharing a kind of common sense of um, fascination with voids and shapes. The the mm -hmm. view up to the uh, to the Dome of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, you know, can't help but have uh, been in your mind, or or vice versa. The powder room can't have not been in your mind when you're looking up to photograph yeah. these ar arcades that are lifted up into the sky, and the the blind door, the blind Gothic door, and then mm -hmm. the house in Marathon, Texas, uh, which becomes a kind of icon of of. Um, how do you draw a house in a sense? You know, you learn to make yeah, a yeah. rectangle and then put a triangle on top of it. Um, you yeah, were talking yeah, to me yeah. about Michael Benedict's uh, book on um, the architecture of reality. Yeah, there's a great little, a great little book that um, Michael Benedict was a, was a professor of architecture at the University of Texas. Um, and, you know, he, the way he talks about architecture, I think is a nice parallel to how I've thought about painting and he talks about these different qualities of what makes um he was sort of um talking in opposition to a kind of ironic wink wink postmodern approach to architecture yep. um and thinking about structures that really felt like they had a reason for being mm -hmm. without any extra frills and that went anywhere from he talks a lot about Louis Kahn and the Kimball building and he talks about structures like this in West Texas from, yeah. from Marathon where it's not so much about the, the grandeur of the structure but about the way the structure sits in its landscape, how it addresses a viewer. I love this Marathon image how, I mean, it almost feels like it's out of an icon, um, how it's, you know, there's kind of just so-ness about how that triangle sits on top of the rectangle um, and, with, and with its blank rectangle uh, in the in the perfectly centered on the yeah uh, totally on the apex yeah yeah um, so so Benedict talks about presence and significance and materiality and one of the uh, one of the major qualities of a successful piece of architecture in his mind was this kind of elusive sense of emptiness mm -hmm. that is not like a melancholic emptiness it's more of like a 
a void that invites or a void that suggests. Um, and of course, yeah, with that image of the Kimball, yeah. it's, it's such a successful way of you know, creating a shape that is iterated and reiterated, but in its ultimate, or actually that, you know, from the entrance side, the way that you're drawn into the building is through this, almost like a vacuum that is sort of sucking mm -hmm. you into the, into the museum. Um, in, a, in a very gentle way, but nonetheless uh, saying, come under this arch and come, it's like into, a, come into this yeah. tunnel. Yeah. It's like the way that a fireplace draws, you yes. know, you want, yeah. um, you want in a, in for architecture, you know, for a home or whatever, this, that kind of gentle draw, but like a fireplace, you, that doesn't always mean that you're stepping right inside it. So yes. yeah. yeah, with these paintings, I'm thinking a lot about that, that draw, and then also sometimes a kind of sense of barrier at the same time. Um, this is a painting that, in, that intrigues me, um, that it, it intrigues me yeah. that it intrigued you. Um, this is Jacques de Chain, uh, who is a, an early, early uh, uh, master of the still life uh, of flowers in the, the bouquet mm -hmm. paintings that come to um, predominate in, in, um, in Dutch painting in the 17th and then into the 18th century. And uh, I was fascinated by the way that this painting with its drawn curtains the, um, the, the niche that seems to go nowhere. Uh, yeah. It's, it's both a container and, and it tends to flatten the image where the, you don't really believe that this bouquet is real because it's all about the, the flowers pushing forward in a sense. And I, um, I was fascinated by a parallel with this painting uh, of, a, of a niche that in a way goes nowhere and is uh, framed by curtains yeah yeah i think that the big the big difference between these two paintings um is i am i'm always aware of the the limitations of painting i'm i'm 100 of the kind of a believer in the alchemy of you know mud and canvas equals magic uh but but also recognizing that you're messing around with mud and canvas, and so so illusionistic space for me usually has a, a shorthand. It's not a Trump Loy observational yes, no. yeah. perspective. Um, there's usually a shorthand, and so they have the curtain shapes there, you know, somewhere between curtains and wobbly columns, um, and then the way that that niche space recesses. Um, it's not, you're not gonna come uh, walk, you know, into the painting in a way that you might be tempted to pluck a flower from the still life. That's right. Um, I was interested in showing uh, people how you, uh, the technique of your painting, and these are three details from the arch painting that we just looked at. Yeah. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the uh, uh, application of basically oil stick um, you're not using a brush any longer. You're basically mm -hmm. using a, um, a, a crayon of some kind to, to apply the paint. And it keeps yeah. that, it's a really interesting tension between the linear because you let the lines uh, show. I, I love the way in the central panel, the way the line colors change from blue to sort of mauve to blue to yellow. Uh, and, and while the color of the green and the white remain relatively constant across that space. And, yeah. and, uh, and it's a, it, it, it strikes me that you've figured out a way to, um, to have your paintings be drawings in a certain way, yeah. almost as well, because drawing is really critical to your working practice. Uh, the wall of drawings behind you that, that we can see in the studio um, this morning, Matt, made a uh, hand-drawn um, uh, synopsis of the, all the slides. And in, in 10 minutes, he had recreated the, the uh, PowerPoint program, yes, <laughs> by hand. Um, and, and this series of drawings, I think is fascinating because you made it during um, your first kind of COVID uh, 
confinement uh, and in Texas where you didn't have a big studio? Yeah, we quarantined. We left New York and quarantined in Texas for a few months. And um, I wasn't making large paintings because I didn't know how long we were going to stay there. Some really people very generously gave me the use of their studio, but I wasn't going to make big paintings that, you know, I'd have to lug back to New York. So I was just working on on drawings and it was kind of a weird undefined season that we all went through not knowing kind of when it was going to end and these these arch drawings that were individually kind of about repetition uh I, I made dozens of these drawings over and over um it, you know felt like there was endless um endless iterations to play around with color and then also just felt like marking the time um well, like like a like a, a a piano composition that you take one theme and then you make infinite variations on it. Mm -hmm. um, I I this seems to me to be the uh, the moment when a group of paintings that are that uh, you're still working through, where this kind of arch that's part rainbow, part you know cinema. Um, um, Mm -hmm. the, the surrounding of the stage and it, it's a little bit Radio City, a little bit uh, Rainbow, um, a little bit Byzantine. And, uh, yeah. and it's, it's a fascinating group of things. And arches now are, um, it seems to be more than door shapes or window shapes are, are dominating what you're doing these days. And, mm -hmm. and for that reason, when you were uh, attracted to this Samradam, painting of the interior of the Birker uh, in Utrecht from uh, 1645. Uh, this, uh, this is one of our most beautiful depictions of space and light. And I, I, I brought in this detail to, to just say um, that when you start looking at it, you are also aware of the kind of mathematical games that are being played in it, which are akin to the games that you like to play, I think. Well, also the, the the way the space is constructed, it, it it draws you in, but at the same time, that space um, is so complicated by its own interruptions that it it also, as a painting, kind of collapses back flat. It kind of yeah. seesaws between deep space and graphic flat patterning, almost. Yeah, I think that's particularly true when you start looking at it in parts, as we're doing here, right. With with the floor in the painting, it, um, it's much it draws, more spatial. Yeah. It really, because you have a place to stand. And yeah, when you, exactly. but when you start look, looking at a painting like this, you see different things about the, um, about the structure when you start taking it apart, a bit like you're taking the Caracara apart and, and reorganizing it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I know you, one of your very favorite paintings in the collection is our painting by Fry Angelico of the Apostle St. James, the greater freeing the magician, Hermogenes. Um, it, the guy that yeah. looks like he's Christ at the far right is in fact St. James. And, um, and uh, the, um, the, the, the story is a, is a fascinating one. Um, but more interesting than the story to me for your purposes is the geometry of the painting. Yeah, that, I mean, I love the way that the blind door frames the figure of St. James, um, kind of like that central blind doorway from uh, that, you, that you plucked from Instagram. Yeah. Um, but then also that the, the arcade that drops back into space, that, that arcade that like the entry vault of the Kimball kind of draws you in the kind of inviting emptiness. Um, that again frames the figures. And then also that little peekaboo mystery cubby in the top left uh, yeah. that feels like that other structure from Marathon. It does indeed. And I think I may have the iconography of this painting completely messed up in my head, but, um, but that's, that the, the subject matter is less important than uh, the space in which it's uh, taking place for the purposes mm -hmm. of the discussion that we have today. Um, so these arched, uh, this, this very image leads me to uh, back to the arches and then to 
what happened to them next, um, which is that you made a, a show full of these artists, of these arches and sent it off to this crypt in uh, Italy uh, to mm -hmm. be on view in, in, a, in an ancient space, in a, in a, a real, true medieval space. Yeah, the, after making those works on paper, uh, a guy with a really beautiful space in Italy, uh, I'll, I'll kill the name, but it's, it's Grotagli, I think. Yeah. It's right in the heel of the boot. And um, he has an 800 year old ceramic tile factory building that he's turned into an exhibition space. And he, he actually apologized to me. He said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry that, you know, my building is, it's 800 years old, but I promise you the buildings around it are truly old. They're, you know, 15 and 1600 years old, uh, which is absurd. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I, I was aware of the space when I decided to make these paintings and those quarantine drawings became um, accidental studies for, for these paintings. Yeah. Well, um, and here they are. Um, I love this image because even the sort of central doorway gives you that sense of of space interrupted away like the San Radam. And then the, um, the way that the rather dramatic low from below lighting adds a, a level of shadows that kind of sometimes mm. contradicts the internal shadows that are in the painting. Yeah. Um, in the paintings like, like here where you see the, the, the shadow going in one direction and the shadow in the painting going in another. Yeah. Um, the, here we are back to that, uh, back to the notion of the San Radam. Um, I want to push forward so that we can have time for um, questions. And this painting um, came about actually before the arches that are in Italy now. Mm -hmm. And this is an exhibition at Gemini uh, uh, Editions in New York City. Yeah, thinking a lot about not only paintings like the ones in Italy that that are really in direct dialogue with the space, but but a painting that um, is kind of becoming becoming architecture on its own, itself, not only yes. in dialogue with its architectural surroundings, but is it is itself, you know, sculptural, architectural. So this is um, three, and, and three panels, um, the central arch and two uh, striped, horizontal striped pa panels. Yeah, and it's it's 16 feet wide. So when you stand in front of it, it it basically takes up your, if you're in the, if, if you're in the center, it takes up your entire field of view just about you can sense at your peripheries that that the like the barrier of the fence um, isn't permanent it's actually um, permeable but of course there's that kind of central uh, gateway in the middle that that is a you know invitation past the barrier it's ironically like a garden gate in a way yeah. in yeah. the middle of a fence that um, the the iconography of this painting has to do with our border, um, the Texas border with Mexico, I believe, is the is mm -hmm. lying behind it. Um, the uh, this this uh, exhibition in New York was organized by your dealer in Houston, Hiram Butler Gallery, and uh, and it's um, it's I still remember when I first came upon your paintings at Miami Basel. Um, and, uh, and it was the beginning of a sort of um, engagement with them long before I met you. And, uh, yeah. and, um, and it's uh, the, the, the way in which things have moved over that intervening six years or so is fascinating to me. I, th I thought we should look at the whole sensation of arch and openness and flatness and closure and, uh, and non-closure uh, by mm -hmm. thinking of the, like, even the interior of the Kimball um, yeah. in this wonderful photograph. But to stick with, um, with the Kimball, um, here is a painting that, um, that is still in process, I think. Is that not right? Yeah, it's nearly um, finished. I'm, I'm getting ready for a show in Brussels at the end of March. And so um, this will be, this is part of a painting that's maybe done, more or less done. Yeah, and and headed for that show. Um, do you think you can um, uh, show show us your space? I'm hoping for yeah, the best. Please, if I go to stop share, I think we mm -hmm. may see um, better 
your um, your space. I'm, uh, yeah, my, so you can see. I apologize um, to the audience that I'm not quite sure how to work this uh, in terms of technology. Yeah, forgive me for any motion sickness. So you can <laughs> see some uh, studies here for a multi-panel painting that has four arches. And this is what I've been working on for this show in Brussels. Here's the, here's the painting. Um, and for a sense of scale, you know, you can, we didn't really talk about scale as much that the paintings, when they became more architectural, the scale also brought on a more architectonic size so that you're really, experiencing these paintings, um, not in so much of a cerebral space like you would the Duccio or the Fra Angelico, the kind of small panels, but, but um, more of an embodied space. Um, so these, these panels here, the, the arches are about six feet tall and the painting itself is I think 22 feet wide. Yeah. There you go. Just fascinating. So I'm gonna go back to uh, screen yeah. sharing yeah. And um, go to this and share. And I hope we come back to uh, the view of the Kimball because the this sense of arch and wall and arch and wall um, uh, that we find in, um, excuse me, this, something's not going right. Um, here, this this is the pan, one of the panels that you were just standing in front of. And here is the um, full painting in a static view, excuse me, um, that uh, that gives you the sense of the scale. I love that you prop things up on uh, paint buckets um, as a yeah. support. At one point earlier on in your career, you were using timber as the kind of uh, base to lift paintings up off the wall that are that actually weren't hanging; they were just standing. Um, yeah, yeah. And here, here, I think you get the sense there's a there's a place over at the uh, left hand edge of the painting where the panels are not butted up against each other as they will be when you install them uh, at the right. end. But right. when we were looking at this yesterday um, uh, in, in, in review, Matt says, this is such a Kimball painting. And indeed you can see that it, it's, a, it's an image that is hard for a, a young man from Fort Worth to get out of his head. This, this notion of arch, flat, arch, flat, arch wall, arch wall, arch wall. And yeah. uh, I thought that was a, a great way to sort of um, uh, end our, um, our uh, rumination on your art and our building and the art within it. Um, I'm going to go to uh, stop share and then I'm gonna look for the Q and A's and see who, um, who has had something uh, to say. Um, so um, one, uh, one person uh, commented that he grew up in Bishop, Texas. So he knows your landscape in, in, the, in the beginnings of the uh, exhibition. Yeah. Um, yeah. One pe person says, how do you know when a painting is finished? Yeah, that's a good question. And it, it maybe it goes back to that, the detail photo where you could see the layers building up. Um, I think for me, I'm, I'm always trying to, um, build a painting that maybe for all of its symmetry and repetition seems resolved but on on second look or on further you know uh, looking you you realize it's not actually totally resolved I, I really I really like when a painting has a sense of harmony but is not totally um, conclusive it, it just is kind of barely holding together so it, for me it's about finding a point where it's not um, where the painting isn't answering its own questions. Uh, and sometimes that has to do with pushing it through further and further revisions until the, the material feels like it's fully baked. Um, you know, sometimes the first pass at a painting, it just doesn't feel like it's uh, matured enough. And sometimes it, there'll be kind of more dramatic compositional changes where, um, you know, you want the painting to 
give some and withhold some. And sometimes the painting will, you know, give it all away and you and you kind of need to uh, take something back. Back up and take something, take something away from it. One of the things I think we should notice in that that um, slide of details, your paintings never um, though photographed from afar, they might give the impression the facture of them is always very apparent. And you're, you're very aware when you're looking at them of the operation of your hand. So that they, yeah. they, there's a, there's, they're never gonna get slick. Um, I don't see you ever going towards a kind of licked finish as they used to say in the yeah, 19th yeah. century. Measured, measured yeah. and taped. No, yeah. they're always, I mean, it's important when the figures left the paintings, it was important to me that there was still a sense of the, the human um, and the man-made. You can see in a painting like this where the surface really starts to build up and yeah. it's, not, um, it's not a clean polish. It's, there's more of a hand touch. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, they'll seem really graphic from a distance and then closer up you can feel the kind of um, boogers and you know, revisions and that kind of thing. Yes. Um, a, 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 a friend in Houston says, um, you know, the empty tomb is almost seems to be, I mean, if you take it from the Duccio, if you took the mm -hmm. Duccio as a real starting point for some of this, that sense of the, uh, of the doorway being tomb-like in a way, and particularly when you, when you um, put it into a, uh, into a setting that, um, is conducive to that interpretation. I think that <sighs> if you could sum up the evolution of the work from the figurative paintings that we looked at early on to the paintings that I'm making right now, um, I don't think of them as as abstract paintings necessarily. I really think of them as as figurative works with the figures plucked out. So I always, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not thinking about like a De Chirico, endless, swimmy, sublime space, mm -hmm. a kind of, um, you know, swimming through the void. I'm, I'm much more interested in a, in an expectant space, you know, space that suggests, um, that suggests a sub, a subject without, without providing one. Um, so yeah, in the, the tomb, in that Lazarus painting, um, you know, I like thinking about the moment right before the the uh, stone is taken away from yeah. the the front of the tomb, um, and yeah, I guess in a certain way, I think about these paintings as that moment only without the figure, without yeah. the um, with a space that maybe maybe implicates a viewer. Yeah. The um, uh, uh, curator friend of ours asks uh, comments that for the Renaissance painters that we've referenced, like uh, um, Duccio and Fra Angelico, this, this um, since the use of the architecture also was kind of tied to a, a revival of humanism. And, um, and I yeah. think another, another uh, viewer asked um, about your reference to Flannery O'Connor and um, and so we we've got these these non non visual uh, it, I'm, I'm very interested in the way that you talk about your work in sometimes in terms that are not visual at all not not about not not almost not material so that there there's a literary you're thinking about literary things, you're thinking about philosophical things, you're thinking about, um, you're reading books like Flannery O'Connor side by side with Michael Benedict's, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, architectural history thing. And then going back to the Renaissance, I, I know you love Sassetta also as, yeah. a, uh, as a, 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 I wish we had one to, uh, to compare your work to, but it's, a, it's that, um, I like the way that you're that you engage with things that are extraneous to art practice sometimes. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the painting titles borrow from from fiction. You know, Flannery O'Connor stories, uh, Barry Hanna short stories. Um, 
there's a writer I really love named Jamie Quattro and I'll uh, I'll ask her if I can use her titles for painting titles sometimes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that 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 these paintings, well, one, I'm a sucker for for good fiction and for really good sad country music. Um, uh, and also, I mean, you know, those mezcal paintings, I'm kind of a sucker for mezcal too. But what I like, what I like about mezcal, what I like about yeah. good fiction is it, uh, and, and what I like about good painting is you are b being simultaneously, when you're, when you're tasting mezcal, you are, you are being lifted out of yourself. You know, it is, it is literally a, a spirit. Mm -hmm. um, you're sort of being lifted into kind of an elevated place, but only by way of being grounded. I mean, when you, when you yes. taste good mezcal, like when you taste a, a good wine, you're tasting the ground from the hillside next to the river under the shade of that tree where mm -hmm. the plant grew. Um, so it's a very earthy, a very embodied way of experiencing, you know, the yeah. spirit or, or, or elevation. And, and we talked a little bit about Flannery O'Connor earlier. Um, uh, Flannery O'Connor has a very earthy way of getting at non-earthy subjects. Um, so, you know, an epiphany happens in the form of getting knocked in the head with a book or having, you know, someone try to drown you or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I think a lot of these are contending, a lot of these paintings from me are contending with a kind of um, lofty existential space, you know, the, the realms of, of uh, belief and doubt, but only by way of real life feet on the ground experience um, it's like it's like in, in it strikes me that in in uh, fiction you are both following the narrative but you're simultaneously being uh attracted and, and distracted in a very good way by the language so there's yes. yeah, there's, yeah. there's both the story and the um and the means of the and the craft means, and yeah, yeah the, the craft and the, and the and 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 in a way you know looking at art is that way too where you have you have both the the sense of even if it's ab an abstraction like yours you're you're in the presence of of the, the the thing but also being seduced by the the method i mean that's not true yeah. in everybody's art but it seems to be very much to be true in yours well there's there's a um i talked about the the space being formed with a shorthand um, so whenever there's a sense of illusion in these paintings, it's only, it's a kind of fleeting illusion. It, you're never, like we talked about with the, with the still life, you're never, um, you're never really duped by the illusion. The painting ultimately collapses back flat. The, the illusion, the illusion kind of cracks. Um, and it's like seeing a magic trick and having the magician explain how the card trick works and then doing it again. And the card trick still sings, even though you know how it's being done. Yeah, it, yeah. So there's, it's not like, um, it's not all smoke and mirrors. Um, there's a kind of pleasure in knowing how it works, but also um, <laughs> sort of feeling the alchemy at the same time. Forgive, <laughs> forgive my coughing fit. It's not related yeah. to your to your uh, to yeah, your talking. verklempt. Um, so there are uh, there are a number of questions that have to do with technique, and yeah. uh, and about um, panel versus canvas. I think it's I think everything is canvas mostly, isn't it? Anywhere where I said panel, that is, um, I mean, it's a separate canvas from. Yeah they're 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 multiple canvases yeah so the big pink painting is if i said it's seven panels it's seven canvases yes. that that will exist as a single painting but you don't paint on wood uh 
no. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. And do you no. prepare your canvas, your stretchers yourself? I do. Um, it depends. I mean, I, I don't have the technical chops to create these shaped canvases. So I get those fabricated um, <laughs> for the own longest way. time. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'll make, and you can see these drawings behind me. I will make 30 variations on a single theme um, until something feels right. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the painting that, um, that you talked about in New York, yeah, the gate, the gate the, painting. The, yeah. the three cams. Yeah, here are all sort of different approaches to a very similar, well, lots of them, um, yes. that you know, are me just trying, kind of waiting for something to kind of click into place. And then if it, if that happens, if it feels, if, if, if it feels right, then I'll, I'll move on to a kind of full scale painting. And I, I should say that the drawings have become really important to the painting practice. And that's probably why the oil sticks became my kind of preferred tool. The, the touch, the way that your mark is laid down on the canvas with the oil sticks feels more closely tied to drawing. Um, and, and, and there have been a couple of people who asked to, um, asked to know a little bit more about the um, oil sticks. Do you by any chance have one to hand? Oh yeah, sure. This yeah. is, you can see my, uh, if, if RNF oil sticks ever goes out of business, then I will have to go do something else. Yeah, um, so they're, yeah, these they're, like, are, they're like big crayons, but softer yeah, so than, a, than a Crayola. Yeah, it has the texture of like a lipstick. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's creamy oil paint. Um, you know, this is cadmium red. It's the same pigment and linseed oil that you'd get with oil paint. It has a little bit of natural waxes in there so it can hold its uh, kind of bar form. And the way that a lot of people use them is they'll put them on the canvas and then thin them out with mineral spirits. And the way I use them is more like a, like a pastel or a crayon. I'm, yeah. I'm just uh, putting them straight onto the canvas, unthinned and un know, unmediated by any kind of other medium. Except perhaps by an underlying layer that still shows through. I mean, there, you, that's the only, yeah. strikes me as the only kind of mixing that you're doing uh, on the yeah. canvases. Yeah. Um, I, I love the analogy to lipstick because if, in fact, when you pick, pick up the Cabby and Red one, you, yeah, that was you see, I mean, it's really, it's really like, you know, okay, yeah. I'm going to mm -hmm. make myself up as a clown, you know, here, mm -hmm. I, here I am. Yeah, Listen, I, we've come to the end of our hour, and I think we should probably sign off. Um, every, I, I hope every everyone who is commenting has uh, been loving what you've had to say and very interested in your uh, your creative process as well as your um, view of other works of art at the Kimball or indeed mm -hmm. elsewhere. Uh, and and. Uh, we can't wait for you to get back to Fort Worth. I know you come to visit your parents um, and, mm -hmm. and we would love to, um, once, this, uh, once this is all over, maybe we can all regather in the, in the, uh, in the studio. But we've got, we've got many people, uh, there's a friend of mine in Zurich who's watching and a friend in uh, outside New York City and um, some uh, friends in Houston. We've had generally about, uh, well, we have now 164 people listening, which is many, many more than we could actually get into the uh, into the uh, galleries. Yeah. So, um, so we we hope to have a real encounter at some point, and that people will be able, one place or another, to uh, to see your work. Um, it, it you could see some things in in Dallas at the Barry Whistler Gallery, and some things down in Houston at the Howard Butler's Gallery, and and then also in New York if you're there. Yeah. So, listen, um, I want to thank you for. Um, for being on with us today, Matt. I should say also that Matt is the father of two little boys whom he uh, wraps in stripes <laughs> or <laughs> photographs in their, in their, in their diapers against uh, Serapi rugs. So the children are subsumed into your artwork as well. <laughs> Self-serving. Yeah. Yeah, and I should just say, growing up in Fort Worth, the Kimball is um, sort of the way that I learned to look at art. So. Um, yeah, that we didn't talk about it as much, but the the Georges de Latour and the Caravaggio paintings. Yeah, uh, I don't think I would be a painter without them. 
Um, so uh, thanks for having me on. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, it's a place that I hold really dear and those paintings are really important to me. Excellent, thank you. And everybody, um, I'm supposed to have a final slide of this, but I'm not quite sure how to get to it. Um, on February 20th, uh, Jennifer Castle Price, my colleague here at the Kimball, will be talking with Matt Clark. Um, we didn't plan it that way. Uh, and Matt Clark is a painter who uh, lives in Dallas and, uh, and Jen is gonna talk to him on February 20th at 11 o'clock. Mark your calendar, uh, go to the Kimball, uh, kimballart.org and find the link you can, I think you can probably register now uh, so you get a link um, and then put it aside so you can find it again. Uh, listen, everybody, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm going to um, end the meeting and uh, everybody uh, uh, just give your muted round of applause to Matt. It's been a great time. Okay, <laughs> thanks. thanks everyone. And thanks, uh, everyone. stay safe. Thank Bye. you, George. Bye. Thanks.